One does not simply walk into Mordor. The land of shadow. Welcome everyone. I'm very excited about today's Shadowcast. We're, we're going to look into all things evil in episode 6, Udun. It seems like almost everything that happens in this particular episode revolves around the evil in Middle-earth. It's just jam-packed, so I can't wait to get started. The title of this week's episode is appropriately called Udun, which is Sindrin, meaning the underworld. It's a perfect way to describe the making of Mount Doom. So, if you guys are ready, let's delve deep into all things evil in Episode 6. Let's enter the dark beneath the rings of power and dig deep into the underworld. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie, This shadow cast on episode 6, Udun, delves into Tolkien's underworld. Udun was also the less used name of Morgoth's vast fortress of Untumno in the far north of the world. It was the first and greatest of Morgoth's citadels and the home to hosts of demons and monsters that troubled the world for millennia. Sauron also used this name for the veil behind the Black Gate of Mordor in honor of the first Dark Lord. Before I jump in, I'd like to take a moment to spotlight all the wonderful practical orcs we see in this episode. This episode begins with the armored hand of Adar placing seeds beneath the soil, and he says quietly in Quenya, new life in defiance of death. Though we discover once and for all in this episode what Adar is, it seems he is unable to release his elven past completely. Adar rallies the orcs before battle, inflaming their grievances. By torchlight under a vast tree, he says, It is time to throw off our shackles, for we will be slaves no more. Throughout this speech, he uses the word we and closes by saying, Though some may die, we fight as brothers and sisters for our own land. Brothers and sisters, hmm, there's female orcs in there. The orcs begin chanting the word, Numpot, which supposedly translates as death in the black speech or maybe one of the orcish dialects. We then see Adar and the orcs march to the tower of Ostirith. They break down the doors and the orcs tell Adar the castle is empty. Adar says no, he can smell the elf. We see the evil face carved in the rock over the black sword. Waldrig asks with deference, where is he? What happened to Sauron? A question we'd all like answered. A Rondir hiding at the base of the tower lights an arrow and shoots it, hitting the rope wound around the tower. 
He jumps over the wall and blocks the doorway into the keep. Without the rope, the tower crashes down, nearly hitting Adar. The entire wall of the fortress falls upon the orcs climbing up the hillside. It's an exciting action sequence that's fun to watch, but it feels a bit too easy. We see the villagers cheering as most of the orcs are killed. They make for the village to defend it against those who remain. We then cut to the three Numenorean ships. Isildur crawls from his bunk to check on his horse. Then he goes out on the deck as the sun rises. He meets Galadriel there for the first time. She asks if he has come out to see Middle-earth on the horizon. She says she saw it nearly an hour before. Keen are the eyes of the elves, says Isildur. A quote pulled directly from the Lord of the Rings. We are then shown exactly where the Tower of Ostirith is located on the Queen's map. I had thought it was here. But we see from this map that it's actually up further in Mordor, well within the plateau of Gorgoroth. We cut back to the village as a Rondir tries unsuccessfully to destroy the Black Blade. The villagers fill the orc holes and prepare a defense. Bronwyn and a Rondir rally the people to its defense. Bronwyn and Theo then share a tender moment I want to note because she delivers one of my favorite Tolkien quotes from The Lord of the Rings, the moment when Sam looks up out of Mordor and sees a star in the sky. There, peeping among the cloud rack, above a dark tour, high up in the mountains, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked out on the forsaken land, and hope returned to him, for like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Beautiful. It's nice to see they are trying to bring as much of Tolkien's lyrical writing into the show as they can because you can feel its absence versus in the Jackson films, which was elevated by Tolkien's writing. There is a moment when a Rondir shares with Bronwyn the elven ritual of burying seeds in the ground before a battle, which ties back to Adar's words in the beginning of the episode. A nice way to bring those together. Night falls, and we have a tense moment of waiting. Then torchlights appear, and the orcs march to the attack. Fighting ensues. There is a great scene of a Rondir fighting a massive Uruk. The great beast must be an ancestor of one of the big black Uruks from out of the east. Click on the link in the upper right to see my video on the orcs of the Second Age. He puts out the eye of the orc, and then the Uruk tries to return the favor. Ugh. Bronwyn kills the orc with a stroke of a sword to its back. A gruesome and bloody brawl, to be sure. The villagers fight back hard and win out against the orcs. Or so it seems. Arondir notices red blood on one of the bodies rather than the black blood of an orc. They discover that many of the dead are villagers in orc gear. Their victory turns quickly to defeat as arrows fly out of the dark in a renewed attack. Many are killed. Bronwyn is hit with an arrow, and I felt sure at first that it meant her death. They barricade themselves in the tavern and cauterize her wound with the elven siege which appears to save her. The orcs break down the door and enter with Adar, who demands the black blade. Arondir refuses to give it up, and the orcs begin cruelly killing the villagers. Adar says, kill the woman next, 
as an orc places a blade over the neck of Bronwyn. Theo, who secretly watched where a Rondir hid the blade, gives it up to save his mother's life. I guess we'll never know if a Rondir would have done the same. Intercut with these scenes, we see the mounted army of Numenorians thunder across the Southlands. I'm not sure how they knew that the people of Ostirith were in such peril at that very moment, but they come to the rescue all the same. The ride of the Numenorians is very reminiscent of the charge of the Rohirrim during the Battle of the Pelennor. Visually stunning. The Numenorians rush into battle, and there is great swordplay and heroic orc kills. Heads are hewn and horses leap. Elendil is nearly overwhelmed by orcs, and though Isildur rushes to his aid, it is Halbrand who saves his life. We see Galadriel exhibiting some cool, legless moves on her horse, dodging arrows and spears. She calls to Arondir to find their orc captain. He points out Adar fleeing on a horse and tells her he carries a weapon of the enemy and must not get away. She takes off after him with Halbrand in pursuit. What follows is an impressive horse chase through the woods. Finally, Adar is cut off by Halbrand, who stabs him in the hand and then prepares to kill him with his spear. What follows, unfortunately, puts Halbrand back in play as a possible Sauron, in my opinion. Halbrand says he will kill Adar for what he has done. Adar thinks he must have killed his family, but Halbrand remains silent, which is odd. Galadriel steps in and stops him from killing Adar because they need him. Adar is captured and taken to a barn in the village and chained. There is a wonderful exchange between he and Galadriel, where we learn that Adar is no longer elven, indeed been transformed into an orc, one of the Moriandor, the sons of the dark, the first orcs. He tells her they prefer the name Uru. Adar's black blood confirms this. He tells her all of this is about giving his people a home. We realize throughout this episode that Adar is acting alone, not under the orders of Sauron, who he believes is dead. Adar tells Galadriel, after the defeat of Morgoth, Sauron called the orcs north, and using dark sorcery to harness the power of the unseen world, tried to triumph over the weakness of flesh. But no matter how much blood he spilled, he failed. Something was missing. Mithril, perhaps? Adar says he had enough. He split Sauron open and killed him. Galadriel does not believe him and says she will kill every last orc alive, and only then, when all of his children are dead, she will kill him. Then Adar really cuts her deep, saying, It would seem I am not the only elf alive who has been transformed by darkness. She is enraged by his words and nearly kills him, and is only stopped by the words of Halbrand, a reversal from moments before. She lets him live, but leaves a cut on his throat. As they leave, Adar asks cryptically to Halbrand, Who are you? Hmm. The writers of the show are clearly leaving the door open to Halbrand being a possible Sauron. There is a moment between Galadriel and Halbrand that might be interpreted as feelings of affection between man and elf, but I see it as something deeper. If indeed he is Sauron in disguise, or even just a man perhaps, he is saying that it is the good within her that makes him forget his past. It could be read either way. 
After this, Halbrand is uplifted as the king of the Southlands in a rousing moment where the crowd cheers. Then we cut to Arondir and Theo talking quietly about how the power of the black blade drew him. Arondir gives him the bundle with the blade inside and tells him to be rid of it by giving it to the Numenorians to drop into the sea. Theo unwraps the blade and discovers it has been replaced with an axe. Then comes the moment we have all been waiting for. We then see that Waldrig has returned to the fortress of Ostirith, and he has the black blade. I think Adar, realizing they were being attacked, swapped the blade for the axe and ran from the village to give Waldrig the opportunity to get away. I am surprised, however, that no one unwrapped the bundle to check. We see Waldrig has ignited the blade with his blood. He drives it into the base of the statue, and we see that it is indeed a key. It unlocks the waterway held back by a dam, which floods the plain of Gorgoroth below. Watching this, you can't help but think of the waters released from Isengard in the Two Towers. The rushing waters fill the orc tunnels, gathering to a flood that falls into the very cracks of doom beneath Orodruin. When the cold waters of the mountain crash into the molten fire, a vast combustion is released, and Mount Doom bursts into flame. Huge volcanic rocks of molten fire fall all around, destroying everything in their path. A vast cloud of smoke and ash spreads out across the plateau of Golgoroth, eventually engulfing the village as Galadriel stands in awe of the vast power and might of Mount Doom. I also notice that Adar has escaped his shackles. I wonder who released him. So ends Episode 6, Udun. Wow, what an ending. It is going to be hard to top that in the Episode 8 season finale. From the moment I realized that the lands of Mordor Mount Doom and the Rise of Sauron would be featured in Season 1 of The Rings of Power. I have wondered how it would unfold. The Orc Tunnels and the Water was a surprising twist. I was right about the Black Blade being used to ignite Mount Doom, but I didn't know how it would happen. It's interesting the way they have woven together new story with elements of Tolkien canon. The show is by no means perfect, but so far I find it very satisfying. Wow, only two more episodes to go in season one. Um, I'm beginning to feel like I can see how Mithril and the forging of the rings will work together in this story of the Second Age. Um, it's certainly not canon in all aspects, but it still makes for an interesting story that does feel uh, Tolkien-esque. Um, I predict that the big finale of episode eight will be the full reveal of the Dark Lord, or it will be a cliffhanger that won't reveal who Sauron is until the first episode of season two, which they may do. I'm hoping they reveal Sauron at the end of this um, season. Um, so I want you to check back next week for our next installment of uh, episode seven breakdown. Uh, so until next time, I hope to see you looking down into the Morgul Vale from the heights of Kirith Ungol.